Okay, and I am going to share our second module here. You ready, Paul? You excited? <laughs> there it is. Okay. All right, let me know again if you can hear the sound when I start playing this video. I forgot last time, even though I gave instructions about how you would be able to hear my sound, I just started drinking tea and doing other stuff. And so I had to remember I'm supposed to be very quiet during these. Okay. Oh, I did not click something. And one person, I can't tell who, they, uh, they're not muted. And I can hear you moving around. OK. Do, 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 do. I'm just building suspense. All right, everybody, get your snacks ready. So the plan for Hole in the Mountain is, number one, they want to suppress brome and reed canaries, some invasive cool season grasses that are here, uh, some pressure on uh, some of the thistle uh, that are here, and then to try and stimulate plant biodiversity, uh, as well as provide um, some good habitat for Dakota skipper and other grassland wildlife species. It's been a long journey, I guess, for my my dad has been, has, veered off from the rest of the, the herd and has kind of gone down this road in our area. Um, so I just kind of joined in. The goals for my farm is to, yeah, pass it on to my, my kids, something for their kids to have as well. Um, and also to, I guess, to start something, a uh, relationship of uh, working with um, all these different agencies. Um, to start a relationship between cattlemen and these agencies, I guess is my ultimate goal to help area farmers and ranchers. Adaptive management grazing is about fitting the grazing management to your context. And your context includes everything from climate, topography, vegetation, uh, financial uh, constraints, what equipment you have available, uh, for your particular operation or for that particular site, what are the water resources, what are the fencing resources, what class of animal we have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in adaptive grazing, we take that all into consideration and it also allows us to meet multiple goals on that site. One of them obviously is we have to take care of the animals, so we have to meet uh, their needs, uh, but we could have, uh, uh, maybe we're going after smooth brome on that site, or maybe we, we just want to cycle carbon on that site, or maybe we want to set back willow on that site. We can have multiple goals on a, any given acre. We can have multiple goals, goals across an entire unit, and we can be adaptive or just as we move across there. Um, in adaptive grazing management, we're controlling the timing, frequency, intensity, and duration of those animals being on that site. And that has a very substantial influence, not only in the vegetation of that site, but also on the soils on that, the health of the soils on that site. My farming operation is consists of cow calf, um, stockers, which is uh, last year's calves typically, yearlings. Um, we finish them out on forage, hopefully grasses from from the area. Um, sell to a Thousand Hills Lifetime Graze, and. I row crop farm, corn, soybeans, and that's pretty much it, I guess. Conventionally, I don't, I'm not an organic farmer. <laughs> They're progressive, I don't know, progressive, close by um, health food. So I don't know, kind of the right thing to do. Everybody wants healthy, know where your food came from type of situation and that's an outlet for us. Well, I'm not a fan of chemical farming. Um, I'm like more all natural type things and uh, to work with nature instead of against it. 
is I guess the main thing. So how do we make this happen? First of all, it's it's um, getting a handle on your context, getting a handle on your goals, and and making sure we can find something that fits within and find opportunities uh, within those two things uh, in order to do what we can. Um, a big part of that is is again we're we're controlling timing, timing, frequency, duration, and intensity uh, on that site, um, and and the frequency is related to rest. And so how how hard we hit it, how long we rest will have a huge impact on plant diversity uh, on that site. Um, most of this on the adaptive grazing portion of this, we plan to only be on any given acre or any given parcel of this for uh, less than two or three days. Prefer some of these sites, we only wanna be on literally for a few hours out of the entire year with a very long rest period. Um, when we're down in the bottoms, as you see behind us here, where we have the reed canary, where we have the brome, uh, we wanna hit that hard uh, in the spring and maybe hard again later in the fall, um, depending on our timing. Uh, on the uplands, uh, we want very short duration uh, and we wanna um, try and address some of the thatch layer that's here. We want to not have a negative impact on the root system that's here. So we're gonna minimize uh, the amount of, of plant material that we take out there, and then we want long recoveries out there, uh, and try and facilitating as much trample as possible. And we do that through high stock density, stock density being the pounds of animal per acre. Uh, the pounds of animal per acre and our rest period are really um, our most powerful tools here. There's lots of ways we can facilitate that. We can facilitate that through uh, just the use of polywire and temporary posts, which is a technology we now have av available to us. But we can also do that by strategically placing uh, watering facilities, by strategically placing uh, minerals uh, and salt blocks, by strategically placing things like oilers, um, if we want to impact brush, we can limit how much access they have to woodies uh, so that they'll use that for rubbing and for shade. Uh, but we do that and match the size of that to the size of the herd so they really concentrate on those sites. So it depends on our goals and what we're trying to do. Um, but we can move these things around. We can also use what's called paddock within a paddock where as we're doing other work out here, we can set up a small area to facilitate a high degree of trample uh, on the vegetation that's out there, get stock densities targeting, if at all possible, in that quarter to one million animal pounds per acre range, adding a very long rest period to that. Uh, those animals are only on those sites anywhere from 20 minutes to maybe three hours at a time. Uh, they don't need water there. They're going to water. They're coming from water. But we can use that uh, to really strongly and powerfully facilitate some vegetative management on that site. And so those are some of the things we can do. Uh, again, this is adaptive. And so we want, when we have all the tools in the toolbox and we have a skilled grazer uh, working on this or with some good positive coaching, um, we can direct some of that, kind of like a director directing an orchestra and orchestrate some of the change we want to see on that site. There's a lot of different things that um, I haven't seen before, different plants, different birds, bugs. Um, I can't identify any of those things. It's just something new. Uh, almost daily, um, you just notice something different at all times. What's improved? Uh, soil health is improved overall. Um, organic matter. Um, Moisture holding capabilities also have increased dramatically. Uh, we don't notice this recent drought like we do in the conventional pastures. Um, so total rangeland improvement. It's, there's there's a, a reward for everything that you do, I think. Um, just have to see the positive on each, each edition. Um, wildlife included, it may not be always welcome, but it has to be a positive. Some of the metrics, you know, first of all, one of our goals is obviously going to be the health and well-being of the cattle. Uh, we need to maintain that. So we're going to look at rumen fill on the left side, behind the rib, below the spine, and in front of the hip. 
so at least once a day we want to see some good room and fill that means they're they're getting enough nutrition to stay healthy out there uh, as well as facilitating performance um, we we can measure uh, pre and post uh, using something like a grazing stick or a yard stick or even a tape measure uh, out there and measure pre and post graze are we getting the level of utilization we want uh, out there um, to ensure they're getting not only adequate nutrition, but also protecting the root system, particularly on these uh, drier sites. Uh, we want to look at the degree of trample that was out there. We want to map and monitor when they were there and how long we were there. Uh, we need to know the size of the area. We need to know our herd mass so that we can calculate stock density in pounds per acre. And then we want to monitor that um, and, and not only immediately after the graze, uh, but also in the next and coming years. But one of the things we do in adaptive grazing is we don't do it the same all the time. And we find that when we don't do it the same all the time, we get a much more robust response out of the plants. It's kind of like an elite Olympic athlete. You know, the Olympics are on now, so everybody's got Olympia, the Olympics on the brain, you know, so to speak. But an elite Olympic athlete, doesn't matter what their uh, event is, um, they don't just train that event. They just don't go through a discus or they just don't do, you know, the 100 yard dash. Um, they'll do other things. They may be on a rowing machine. They may be a, a sprinter, but they may, their trainer may put them in a pool. They're adjusting things up and we need to do that. Our bodies are complex biological systems, just like prairies and grasslands are complex biological systems. And they're designed um, to handle uh, acute disturbances within moderation and given uh, adequate recovery time, it makes them stronger. I would love to convert, be able to uh, convert conventional tillable farmland into rangeland, pasture land, and be financially feasible at that. That's, the, that's my barrier. Um, also, um, local landlord knowledge of what you're trying to do. Um, most everyone thinks that you're trying to devalue their land by grazing versus actual conventional farming. So that's that's another barrier. And then after a, a duration of doing the same thing, even uh, rotational grazing over a number of years, you stop to see that progression and then you need to change something else. So we throw. Yep, have to adapt to that, throw a, throw a wrench into everything that you thought you knew and start over again. And then you see another jump in and things. So. Scared. <laughs> yeah, scared to death that we're gonna, I'm going to mess something up where I will lose my chance to, to help out, participate in, in a project. 100% farming with nature works. <laughs> uh, it's been positive for me. It, it, you uh, get to hear what all the uh, the older, I don't know if it's older, specifically older generation, um, but there's a there's some, I would say, I don't want to call it by, bad blood, but um, they don't necessarily like different agencies coming in and taking their land away, I guess, is, is part of what they feel. And it's we have to we have to work together and preserve what we have. All right, great job to Kent and Nick. Um, I know Nick can't hear me right now, but he said he will probably watch this recording later. And so we really hit the producer jackpot on this project. Um, Nick and his family are just wonderful to work with. I know Amber can speak more to that. And uh, just to give a little prelude before we go into questions, and we already have so many good ones that are popping up both in the Padlet and in the chat. So just a reminder that you can use the Padlet for this time and that'll help us interact with one another a little bit better. And so I'm gonna pop that into the chat again, just so folks know where to go to access it. And the thing I was going to say is that um, 
one of my roles as a regional ecologist, you know, is to try to make sure the landscape's in balance, which is a very challenging thing to do in southern Minnesota because we are very clearly not in balance. And so at Big Prairie like this, um, I was going out on site with Amber and Troy each year, and Amber is a very good wildlife manager, as is Troy, and they're both really want to do the best that they can for the health of that prairie. And so they were asking me as an ecologist, like, do you, do you think the grazing's helping? Like, do you think it's doing all right? And, you know, I can't really eyeball that and no, I'm not a grazer. I don't know a lot about how to bring cows in and be successful. I don't know how to adapt or when to adapt or what we need to do because I just know that those cows are real big. Like that's basically about all I know and that they really like grass, yum, yum, yum. They're always eating it when we're out there. And so after about two years of going on these walkabouts with Amber and Troy, I realized that we really needed to bring in um, folks who have solid grazing expertise and background. And thankfully, Kent said yes when we asked him if he would come out on site with us. And we are so grateful that we have both Nick and Kent working together to just give us a more holistic picture of management at the site because if we're going to partner with producers and we're going to bring cows out onto a site to fill that very necessary grazing disturbance need that our prairies are used to and are built on um, we need to understand what we're doing both from a perspective of a wildlife manager and from a health of a prairie perspective but also from a cattle perspective like what does that producer need to make this viable for them and how can um, we respond and work with each other to kind of find these compromises and balance. And so having Kent's expertise and having Nick's expertise has been just a blessing and <laughs> really vital to this project because I don't know that we could do it without the both of them. Well, we couldn't because Nick has the cows and Kent has the knowledge <laughs> of what to do with those cows. <laughs> so that's my, that's my story about that. I see some uh folks are typing into that padlet thanks so much and we already have questions right out of the gate so pun intended <laughs> so i'm gonna go with those and um oh gosh now i have to i have to scroll back it's becky becky do you want to give voice to your first question about pre and post graze I had to find my mic. Um, um, Kent was talking about pre and post grazing and the level of utilization, and I wrote down his exact words. But I don't know what that means in lay terms. I mean, how? what are you measuring in your pre and post grazing? I measure lots of different things pre and post grazing, but what are you measuring in this particular situation? So Becky, I was just giving examples of some of the things you can measure. It depends on your context and what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? So you want to build your metrics and monitoring based around your goals. Um, for a cattle producer, for example, it may be uh, you know the level of utilization you want out there um, to meet certain performance goals, or or maybe you want a certain degree of trample out there. For example. Um, on some sites, some people would like to see no more utilization than say 50% of the above ground biomass in order to protect the root system. And so you'd want to have an idea of what what it was like uh, before you went out there and after you went out there to see if you're within that goal. Did you put too many, many animals on too small of an area or did you not put enough on too big of an area? And then you can adjust accordingly. One of the beauties of adaptive grazing is that we can adapt every day. We can change every day based on our monitoring and monitoring and observation is absolutely key to making adaptive grazing work. So you got to decide, decide what you want to accomplish out there what are you going to use to measure or monitor that? And then are you meeting those objectives, those goals, or do we need to adjust? Does that help? Yeah, I wasn't looking as broad brush as you just described. I was wondering specific to that site, but you also helped there. But okay. if you could give specific to there, that would also be very interesting. I think I think we're going to, or, or Megan, we're going to hit some of that when uh, Dustin gets on. Is that correct? Should I we spend are. much yeah. time on that? You can, you can answer it a little bit, and then Dustin will elaborate when he gets to the plots. I know we're funneling questions, but it's just because of how the modules are set up. Yeah, so we were, we one of the things, we, you know, we do want to protect that root system out there, that biomass. 
uh, I had asked Amber and and others, you know, at identify. We were trying to identify even areas we wanted uh, very high impact on, such if it was a brushy area or a thistle patch or whatever uh, uh, that we could do. And this jumps into almost another question on uh, leaving animals out there for a short period of time, but directing management that that way, and then knowing what we're doing, you know, knowing how big of an area we're putting out there, what's our mass of animal. Excuse, excuse me that we're putting out there and then are we reaching our goals or do do we need to adjust do we need to do something different next time or do we think we got it it's mostly just creating a feedback mechanism or a feedback loop um, some people use what's called the OODA loop uh, where you basically observe orient uh, execute and and uh, and then just assess what you were doing and and make adjustments on the fly and that's really what adaptive grazing is i think so many times we want to be overly prescriptive and provide a very tight recipe um there's more art uh than this uh, yes there is science but uh like most of our resource management um you know we talk about the art and science piece that's very true here in adaptive grazing and we have to have an active manager set of a manager set of managers out there observing what's going on are we meeting asking the question are we meeting our goals and do we need to adjust next time we go through you're not going to get it always right the first time none of us do but the beauty of a natural system especially when we build rest into it and that's that's part of the management plan is uh, we can come back and do a better job next time or adjust for next time And Becky, if you want to go ahead and ask your second question too, because I know other people have that same question. And I think uh, Amanda also had a similar question that's on the Padlet here. And just a reminder to folks, the way that you access this is down here in this right corner. And then you just hit the plus sign and add your question into the Padlet. You can also use the chat too, but sometimes the Padlet's fun. Well, Megan, it allows me to see other questions popping up related to the question <laughs> in hand. So I'm going to jump into one right now. You know, Tim brought up the grazing stick. That is one metric. Uh, you can use either rising or falling plate meters. There are some more expensive electronic devices. You know, we want to fit the monitoring to the context. You know, how deep do we want to dive? And and we've got Dustin and others doing way more intensive monitoring out there than most grazers are going to do just because time, money, labor and so on and and that's fabulous uh for us to gather that information here um most grazers start to develop an eye with time uh on assessing are they accomplishing what they're doing some may be more, more interested in looking at soil stuff too whether that's a simply a shovel test or uh going uh, through things like a plfa or a haney assessment on the soils again it just depends i know it sounds broad but it totally depends on your context and your goals and and fitting the tools to the situation. Perfect. Kent, do you want to answer some of the fencing questions? How do you really get uh, um, and I should mention that Becky uh, has cattle also. And so <laughs> just for context there too. And so she yep. said, how do you really get the cows to only be in an area for what does it say? 20 to three hours, 20 minutes to three hours. Oh, what I had said so. Okay. Um, first of all, first of all, we need animals that are trained to portable energized fencing, polywire and step in post, basically. OK, and it only takes a couple days for them to uh, figure this out. They need to know and respect what polywire and step in posts are before they enter the pasture. And then once they get the hang of the moves and where we're going and they build a trust uh, relationship with you and, and you with them, um, you can pretty much take these things just about anywhere. It's pretty astonishing. Um, we can formulate, and I, and I wish I had the ability to do graphics here, but we can set up a paddock within a paddock on a very small scale. These animals are used to being moved. Most of them, you can train them to come to a call or signal of some sort. Uh, most of these animals figure out that when you show up with the side by or the four wheeler or whatever the pickup, they're going to get moved. And so they're they're lined up ready to go. And it doesn't take many days to do this, but we can set up a paddock within a paddock. These are pre identified areas that we want to facilitate a higher degree of management with much higher stock density. And we're going to have a list of these as a manager um, that we're going to prioritize, say, this time of year going into the grazing season. 
Are we going to get them all? No. Think of your prescribed burn plan list for the year. Do you ever get them all done? Nope. You know, you do the best you can where you're at with what you got, you know. And so uh, you have these identified as you're going by them. You set these things up. Most managers are out there moving water, moving mineral, moving fence. We can set up a paddock within a paddock. Go do those other things. One, two, three, all those other things. Go back and drop that wire and let them into a bigger paddock for the rest of the day. So uh, it's it's not as difficult as it seems. We're not going to do this on every acre every day all the time. This is on predetermined acres. Uh, we're not going to accomplish every goal in one year going over this ground. So certain things have to be met. We have to have enough uh, vegetation to trample if that's what we're after or if we're going to hit a willow patch or an aspen patch or whatever um you know we want to hit that at the right time to do the best uh have the greatest amount of impact uh when we're going by we always want more on our list than we think we're going to accomplish so we've got options when we do it and we feel we accomplish our goal we check that box off next year other ones other sites rise to the priority list, but we can do this once these animals are trained. We can get a million animal pounds per acre. I work with a dairy grazer in central Minnesota. He's frequently uh, doing this over a million to a million three animal pounds per acre. Oftentimes they're only in there for 30 minutes and then he drops that wire that defines that uh, paddock within a paddock and then they get the rest of what they need for either that grazing period or that day. So it's very, very effective and uh, it's it's uh, one uh, we're more than happy to train people to do. Oh, and I'm going to add some context to that from the producer who, it, you know, is not here, but we asked him some questions that we thought you might ask and this kind of funnels into it. So I'm going to read his response because what he wrote, he he just he's a he's excellent to work with and so i'm not going to do it in his voice i'm just going to read it regular so he uh, one of the questions we asked him is how do you know when to adapt and when to move animals and so this sort of gets at your question becky of how are you moving these cows around and he said um that answer seems like always <laughs> the entire operation is moving grass growth varies daily cattle gain uh and continuous increase in forage demand soils forage type cool season warm season grasses we watch cattle rumen fill and manure consistency we're looking for something that looks a little bit like pumpkin pie <laughs> thanks nick for ruining pumpkin pie for me forever <laughs> some decisions will differ on the class of cattle kent can probably elaborate on this the main thing I see as most important is getting different sources of information from as many different resources as possible. That's how I know when to adapt. I think there's no one man or woman who has all the answers, but has great knowledge of what has or has not worked for them. YouTube, podcasts, numerous books, grazing seminars all have great information. RMC slash Ranching for Profit School was a great experience for myself, but as with many things, there's no silver bullet, one size fits all plan. One recurring thought of mine, and I'm sure I've mentioned, is I'm unsure of the benefit of burning prairie. This is my opinion, and not based on anything other than that I see the burn patch as a waste of good nutrients that if handled slash grazed slash trampled would have better results than a burn. It seems like something, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna read as it's a direct quote, it seems a lazy way of doing something that livestock could do without smoke and removal of important nutrients. From my uneducated observation, I could see bare soil, which could have been ground cover. I have great hopes that the East unit will provide some insight to all of this as we continue to learn more. Um, one other option I feel is a more flexible introductory slash start date for grazing um, or dormant grazing, something that's not allowed currently. Uh, and I would be shocked if tried is feeding on low production areas, hay from food plots. Return for duration of bale grazing or something similar. On our own patcher, pasture this species introduction where we feed native prairie hay we feed animals and we intercede and they said sorry these last couple of paragraphs are not relevant for the modules but just my opinion that i wanted to share um and then he also said that he's tracking all of this using a grazing app called maya grazing m-a-i-a -A, grazing he said it's in depth it's a lot of information to enter in but he's doing his best to keep up with it and that just I just wanted to offer some 
So th that is from the grazer Nick Tuft. And so those are his direct thoughts. And so you can hear already in some of what he's saying, um, we are not going, we don't have plans to stop burning the site, but obviously from a producer's perspective, when you burn, you're taking away good grazing resources. We know that when you burn, you're also doing something very vital in disturbance for the prairie, but it's something that we constantly have to negotiate and talk about with him. <laughs> There's a question, can we clone this producer and scatter about 50 of him in each county across the state? Um, you know, speaking with my DNR hat on, I don't think that's going to pass our clearance level. <laughs> well, Megan, that's that's part of what my motive for being involved with this project is, is that we can use this example and others uh, that are being done uh, in Minnesota and other areas to use it for training um, both resource professionals and and cattle people, livestock people, and saying, look, there's opportunity here. Uh, we can help you uh, train. We can help you with the management. We can. We've got examples to go to, and the beauty is, we're going to see here in a little bit is we're collecting a ton of really good data here through Dustin and others, and that's just going to reinforce all this. So we foresee in the future using this to train more operators. I just want to quick chime in on Nick's comment about watching all the the forage go up in smoke as as he kind of commented to, but um, the reason patch burn grazing was picked out here was because I didn't know if they were going to have the availability of a producer as close by as what Nick was to be out there and move cattle as frequently as what we really wanted to, to impact the prairie. So patch burn grazing, the patch burn was going to drive those cattle movements and that was the original intent of it. So I'm glad we got Nick on board and he's willing to just jump in and do pretty much anything we throw at him. He's been great to work with. So maybe we could go away from the patch burn. I think burning is still very relevant on the prairie. It's it's that extra that the prairie needs besides just grazing. It was out there before even people were the Europeans settled here. So I think we still need it in the toolbox. I agree. I don't get a vote, but I agree. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go to Lisa's question. Um, Lisa, do you want to give voice to your question about how does early season grazing impact early season Forbes? I'm going to stop reading the question so you can read it. Oh, oh I'd have to scroll, but uh, <clears throat> basically, yeah, you know, when we've been doing um, pollinator monitoring, um, you know, not surprisingly, uh, early season resources uh, for resources are greatly reduced, not just on Holland Mountain, but, you know, most of our sites. And uh, it was definitely um, seemed to be further impacted during the drought this year. So then I'm wondering about, um, you know, early season grazing, you know, and how it would further I impact um, those early season forb resources. But, you know, thinking on what I've been hearing from Kent and others, it, it sounds like if you were doing um, adaptive grazing that you could provide some refugia. Does that sound correct? You know, a way to, you know, so that you're you're considering, um, you know, the, uh, for instance, the pollinator, you know, needs in those early seasons. Yeah, great question. Oops, I'm getting feedback here. There, great question. Um, so adaptive grazing just inherently by itself creates refugia. We're not grazing in the same pattern all the time. We're not impacting all acres on the same day. That's spread throughout uh, a season or even several seasons. Um, there can be refugia left uh, if desired, but sooner or later, we're probably gonna want some degree of disturbance out there just from the overall health of the system. And so adaptive grazing allows us to do that. One of the key or sort of easy things we can do in adaptive grazing is we start uh, and end on different sites uh, every year. And so we wanna spread the wealth around, so to speak, if you will. And so uh, doing, doing different, it's about doing different things, different ways at different times. It's not about doing the same thing the same way year in and year out. That's when we run into train wrecks. That's when we run into problems, whether it's on, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service land, DNR land, or private land, uh, we get into that pattern and we constantly see problems. Nick even sort of alluded to that. You know, he said uh, we we do the rotational grazing until we flatline out, and and we see that over and over again. We have to shift and adjust in order to stretch the biological capacity of that site. 
Perfect. There's a couple questions here that are in the same vein in the Padlet, and so I want to make sure that we cover them, and I'm probably going to cover them and answer them just so we can move to our next question that Kent's going to answer. Uh, so somebody said, uh, does Nick do all the moving of the cattle? Yes, he does. Kent does, does not help out <laughs> with moving them. Not on this <laughs> site. I'm on other sites, Megan. Yep. Yep. So. Um, so Nick does all of that. It, partly we're, we're lucky all around with Nick. Proximity makes it very lucky because he has, he lives right next door. And so he has the ability to be on the site regularly. I'll also mention that as part of this partnership at one point, um, in the monitoring module, which you're going to see next, we do have exclosures set up out there so that we can um, have like a pre look at what's going on with the prairie while things are being grazed around it. And at one point this summer, the exclosure fence was down. And because we have such a good working relationship, we were able to just call Nick up and say, can you go close our exclosure fence? <laughs> and he was more than willing to do that. So that just kind of speaks to the partnership. Um, I want to cover a couple of these. So yes, Nick does move all the cattle. Uh, did you seek Nick out or did he find you? Amber, do you want to speak a little bit? There's a couple of questions in the same vein of like how you made that connection with Nick and then also um, how that agreement has worked out. Is it something we pay Nick to do? Does he pay us? <laughs> like how, how does that work? So maybe how you found him and then how how it works. How we found him was kind of interesting. It was just by chance, I guess, uh, just word of mouth. People come out and contact the DNR. Hey, I want to graze this site, or hey, I hear you're looking to do some grazing, or even this one being right along 75, they seen all the fence go up and it started, light bulbs starting going off. So we started getting lots of phone calls in our office. So I just formulated a list. And from that list, a questionnaire was developed, sent out. And based on the responses I got back, I had like a little, uh, like a little, I don't even know what to call it anymore. Just something where it's like a yes, no point ranking system on how they answered. And that's how I picked Nick based on his answers and what he was doing just on his own property nearby. So got him in there, worked through the grazing plan. We have a grazing agreement that we do charge for, but we make deductions based on the work that they're willing to do out there. So with Nick doing all of this fencing and movements we do deduct that off of their rental payment so we do have a payment for it he pays us but it it does get reduced down we we make note of how well he's doing so i'm rambling so <laughs> no you did you did great you answered that question perfectly i just can't get to my mute fast enough you should see how many things i have open on all these different screens it's sort of a uh, overwhelming Okay, I was gonna ask Kent a question. They keep changing and the Padlet keeps changing that I can't figure out what question I was gonna ask Kent. <laughs> I know it was on here. Let me just, uh, oh yes. Um, Kent, there are two questions I want you to touch on. Are there, are there sustainable grazing consultants available everywhere? <laughs> and then um, are cattle producers able to achieve the same results in their cattle when managing for native grassland health as opposed to grazing on a seeded pasture and so if you want to start first with our sustainable grazing consultants available everywhere it's these two questions right here yep very good thank you so i'm going to start with the consultants um uh, yeah the the short answer is are there grazing consultants everywhere yes uh in minnesota through sfa we have several uh, within SFA um, nationally and internationally. Uh, there are a number, uh, Understanding Ag is is one of them. Um, ranch, uh, ranch Management Consultants is another one. Um, there are several outfits doing this on a national and international scale. So yes, they are even internationally. So yes, they are available. <clears throat> um, um, sorry, the other one was, can they do it on native? uh as well as yes uh what's really important here is how it's managed and what's the composition of what's there um, plant diversity is really a huge key uh, for animal performance um, but also the genetics and some of those genetics on some sites are going to have to be developed over time 
um, Janetta. It's you know it's not just singular. There's multiple things going on here uh, when it comes to animal performance and weight gain. But yes, we have producers uh, on native sites as well as tame tame sites, literally finishing cattle to choice and prime. Uh, grade of cattle on both native sites and tame sites. It's about the management. It's about the diversity. It's about the genetics uh, that that really drive that more so than um, I mean the competition what or the the um, compilation of what's out there. Yes, that's important, but it's not the only factor. We have to adapt and manage within what's available in that context again. Okay, this next question is probably a combo for you and Amber. It's talking about the number of animals on the site. So if you guys kind of want to walk us through some of the decisions we made early this year and then how we had to adapt immediately. Thank you, drought. Uh, so someone's asking about how how many animals. It's this question right here. Oh, whoa, I did not know I could do that. It's this number two question. That's helpful. If you guys can see this one, Amber, do you want to start just kind of talking about our our plan and some of the decisions that we made? And then Kent, if you want to talk a little bit about the contingency planning that we did and how we basically had to implement our contingency plan immediately. Sure, so the original patch burn grazing plan was written for 100 cow calf pairs and I say rough number because you're going to throw a bull in there a couple times like later in the season or a couple of bulls. So that's kind of written in there. That gives us the rough number. But um, that was based on some forage clippings from the TNC just across the road, which is very, very similar vegetation response. Sorry, my cat just jumped down. Um, <laughs> distracted by a cat, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but uh, we had to change that slightly when we went to the included the adaptive grazing so we reduced the acres which ultimately reduced the number of animals on the patch burn from 100 down to 70 still sticking with around that four acres per animal but our adaptive grazing kent figured out we're doing what 170 lightweight animals on the adaptive site with those quick movements and he can speak more to the reason why we're going so stock heavy on the adaptive grazing. Yeah, something um, as some background, uh, Megan, I'd like to add that when we put together the plan uh, for this, um, we not only included the hole in the mountain site uh, that had been part of the patch burn graze, but we also had the new site uh, that was on the map to the northeast. Plus we had Nick's land and his goals and context built into this and the adjoining TNC land, which Nick also grazes. And so we factored all of this into developing a management plan for this site this year. Um, we wanted to get high stock density uh, across uh, the adaptive site. These animals were only on some of these acres literally for a few hours out of the entire year. And so these animals were constantly on the move, including either from or to TNC land, uh, land Nick both rents and or owns, as well as the WMA. And so uh, this was all built into that as we moved across, but we really wanted to get high stock density. Nick also had the goal of wanting to consolidate all of his herds uh, from a labor standpoint. Um, he, we wanted to try as much as possible. It didn't happen for a number of reasons. The drought was part of it, uh, but he wanted to just have one herd to work with. And we want that too, because the more mass of animals we have, the greater impact we can facilitate across as we're moving on the lands uh, across the landscape as we move across. So um, we did have to adjust uh, because of the drought. Nick also picked up some additional animals and some additional acres uh, that he wasn't expecting at the time we developed the plan. It was kind of a last minute thing. And so we had to make some adjustments for that. And again, the drought just continued to get worse. And so uh, we had to adjust for that because we wanted to protect the forage resource uh, and the plants out there as well as uh, the, the protect the soil. I can't find the question. 
I hate Padlet right now. It just keeps moving them all around. I was like, I had a question I wanted to ask you, and it'll be our, our last question. I'm going to skip over the best but um, indicators of the return of biological health because we're going to cover not necessarily what the best indicator is, but at least what we chose for this site and how we are monitoring that health, that you know abstract concept of health. And so um, we will talk about that in this next module. There is, I think, probably the Megan, last. There's question. two related. There's two related questions on grace, grass banking, and drought sure. contingency. Is that what you were looking for? Go for it. That okay. could be our last question. So yeah, we did we did build some drought contingency into the initial plan. Uh, there were some sites that Nick had access to that we were not going to graze unless we needed them. Uh, this year due to drought, well, lo and behold, we needed them, unfortunately. So, uh, but we did build some cushion, if you will, uh, into that. And, uh, you know, we're going to have to sit down as a team and assess, do some assessment and make plans for this next year. We'll continue to do that. Um, we always want some drought contingency or even flood uh, contingency, depending on your site. And, and, and if you have a wet year, if you're dealing with a riparian area or whatever, uh, you need a you need a contingency in there for that. So, yes, we do build those in to our grazing plans and even try to identify times uh, or triggers uh, that when those things would kick in. Perfect. And we are out of time, but I'm going to leave us with this last quote from Nick and then Kent and Amber, if you want to access the Padlet um, during this next module and respond to some of these questions that maybe we didn't get a chance to cover this. This is the one I was looking for. <laughs> um, that would be great. And so I'm going to leave you these these last thoughts with these last thoughts from Nick here. So. He says, I think Kent will have very good experience and explanations, but my thoughts about my experience over the last couple of years are so much of working with land and livestock is ever changing and evolving into what we hope is better than yesterday, making sound plans with multiple contingency options within a plan. I have grown to understand that the cattlemen and women need to work the different with the different agencies that are working to protect our environment. Our private landowners should recognize the need for adapting to this type of land management. Most people from my experience don't really understand what the process is and what a difference it makes. Simply explaining the plan doesn't really hit home until year end or years later when you see severe degradation. In those cases, the greatest challenge is to rest the land for multiple seasons or even years to justify and to justify that expense without return. Land management of any kind is a long term investment, even as a renter and tenant. The reward for this is seen during droughts and heavy rain events. My cattle are grazing pasture today and many neighbors have been feeding substitutes all summer and through the fall. I have seen areas that have erosion problems in pasture and with proper management, erosion should virtually be non existent. So those are the last thoughts I'm going to leave you with here for that. We are on a break until 10 o'clock. Get some more snacks, get hydrated. Um, I will copy these into the chat for you, Lisa, and then um, we'll come back and watch some more videos and have some more great conversation. Thanks so much to Kent and Amber and Nick, who I know can't hear this. Thank you, but we're really lucky that you guys are part of the team.